About 2,500 educators participate in our online and face-to-face -face programs each year, which means that we reach about 200,000 students from our um, workshops and our other work annually. You can learn more about Primary Source at our website, http backslash backslash www.primarysource.org. And I just want to say before we go too much farther that um, I have been struggling with my voice lately, so please forgive me if you hear some cracks and bumps in the voice along the way, and do let us know if you have trouble hearing me at any point. Uh, as you know, today's webinar, Culture at the Crossroads, a historical look at Afghan art and architecture, is uh, our final webinar in this three-part series. And this theme has been drawn from the Asia Society's Homeland Afghanistan online resource, which we'll talk a lot more about later. We're very, very lucky to have with us today a scholar who actually worked closely with the Homeland Afghanistan team as they were developing that online resource. We have Professor Sheila Blair of Boston College. Professor Blair teaches about all aspects of Islamic art from the 7th century to modern times. She offers survey courses on Islamic art, architecture, and urbanism, as well as research seminars on the Silk Road, the Islamic book, and arts of the object. Her research is extremely broad. Uh, she has written or co-written 15 books, including several, several international award winners. And she's been the author of over 200 articles that have been featured in journals, encyclopedias, and other collections. Several of her books were written with her husband and co-holder of the Caldwood Chair, Jonathan Bloom with whom she served as artistic consultant to the three-hour documentary, Islam, Empire of Faith, shown on PBS. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that documentary. It's a fantastic resource and a very interesting one as well. Uh, currently, Professor Blair is working on a monograph on text and image in medieval Iranian art and a two-hour documentary for PBS on the arts of Islam. She's also working with the Museum of Fine Arts on a 2013 exhibition at the McMullen Museum of Islamic Art, um, and she's working closely with them on that. We're anxious to see how that turns out. Uh, as I said, Professor Blair was featured in the Homeland Afghanistan collection, and some of the videos that she was the commentator on are going to be featured later in our webinar. I'm sure that uh, her talk today will raise a lot of questions for you, and we will set aside some time for Q&A after her presentation. In the meantime, if anything comes up while she's talking during her presentation, feel free to send in questions using the question box on your control panel. I'll also explain later, when we get to the question portion, about how you can call in and ask a question using your audio, um, either your phone or your mic on your computer. So uh, without any more delay and without um, taking any more time away from Professor Blair's talk, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to her now. I'm going to start, first of all, just by unmuting you. So, Professor Blair, can you hear me? I can indeed. Wonderful, and you're loud and clear. And then I'm going to also go ahead and turn over um, control so we should be able to see your PowerPoint coming up shortly. I'll take just a moment for it to transfer. There we go. And I'm going to go ahead and mute myself so that there's no interference with your sound. So whenever you're ready, you go right ahead, and we'll stop around 5.10 for some Q&A. OK, let's go. Got lots to say. All right, so you can get started whenever you're ready. OK. What I'm going to introduce you today to is the long history, over two millennia, of the art and architecture that was produced in Oh, across 250,000 square miles. That's a pretty big, daunting task. So what I decided to do was to focus on three sites. First of all, Ai Khanum, which is in the northeast of Afghanistan. Then we'll move to Bamiyan, which is in the center. And thirdly, to Herat, which is on the west. And I chose them because, of course, they represent different regions. They also represent different periods. I Hanum is Greco-Bactrian, from something like uh, the 3rd century BC to the 2nd century AD. Bamiyan is 5th to 9th century, and Herat about 13th century to 19th century. So they nicely span the chronological uh, two millennia we have to deal with. They also have a variety of media. We're going to see architecture, painting, metalwork, and various of the other arts. And altogether, I think they nicely show Afghanistan as a crossword. Crossroads. So let's start first with Ai Hanum. That's the one up in the northeast. 
First point to note, all the different spellings. They're all the same. They're all transcriptions of the Uzbek, which literally means moon lady. This is a site, I think you can see on the slide, that's at the confluence of two rivers, the Oxus and the, or the Amu, as it's known today, and one of its tributaries, the Kocha, in the northeast of Afghanistan. You see here when it was being excavated. It was excavated by the French under Paul Bernard from about 1965 until the Afghan Civil War ended the excavations in 1978. And no one has any idea if there's anything left there right now. The site is probably the one that was um, introduced, was set up in the wake of Alexander's um, travel. You all know Alexander the Great, where he came across en route to Iran. Up there, right on the Amu Daria, the mother of rivers in Central Asia. It's a triangular site. Measures about a mile on each side. You can see the Oxus River, the main river of Central Asia, running down the left west side of the map, down here. And over here is the tributary, the Kokcha. This triangle has a natural citadel over on the southeast. And all of this yellow area is a high upper level. But most of the town is situated down here on the plain. And for any of you who've been to Rome or any other Roman sites around the Mediterranean, I think you'll see a lot of buildings and layout that you recognize immediately. It has a very long main street that runs north-south. In Roman terms, we would call that the Cardo. It's crossed at midpoint by what we call in Roman architecture the Decumanus. There's a large gateway. There was a large gateway right here. So it has the absolutely typical layout of a Roman town. There's a big palace. They excavated a large palace. The pool, which is nicely colored on the map uh, blue, like a little swimming pool. And other typical Roman buildings, like a gymnasium. Uh, we're going to see in a moment that there is a large theater right up here, and also a temple down here. And you can see something a little bit better on the black and white uh, plan over here. You can see the outcropping over here, the hills indicated here, and how it comes right down to the edge of the river here. And the temple we're going to look at, which is not indicated for some reason on the colored plan, is right here on the black and white plan. So we have a nice little reconstruction here. And I turned the map upside down so that it, or map the plan upside down so that it matches the map. You can see these long ramparts. It was a walled city. There are about two miles of ramparts around it. And the theater is cut right in here into the mountainside. So you can see all this yellow area on the plan is this sloped hill here. And they exploited the natural terrain of this site by cutting right into the side of the mountain here. The um, theater has 34 rows of seats. It's about 100 yards, about the size of a football field. So you could actually seat something like 5,000 people in this theater. This is a big, big arena. It's larger than the one, say, that was erected at Babylon. Similarly, the gymnasium, which is right down here near the river, is about 100 meters. It's a football field on either side. It's one of the largest that was ever built in antiquity. And so clearly the aim of this city was to recreate Greek life on the Amu, on the Oxus River. And also to do this in a philosophical sense, to make it bigger than life. It's very unlikely that there were really 5,000 people attending a play in this theater. But the idea was to make, to surround you with the accoutrements of Greek life. If we look at the temple, it's similarly large. This is the main religious building. I think you get an idea of the scale from the Afghan who is almost invisible standing on the remains of the ruins. It was just off the main street. It had stone foundations. And they found the remains of a statue. The foot, the marble foot, was, was literally a foot long. I don't know if you've measured your foot recently, but mine is not a foot long. You can imagine how big this statue must have been. It, the 
body of the statue was not marble. Marble is very scarce in this part of the world. So they just made the feet and possibly the heads of marble. The rest of it was made out of clay that was molded over wood with little bits of straw stuck in to make it uh, stick to the armature. And similarly, most of the city is not built of stone. There was stone used for the foundations, again, to mimic Rome. But the rest of it is built of mud brick with wood or clay roofs. And they just use stone to give an idea. And then they cut the rest of the bricks to make them look like they were stone. The excavators also dug up other little accoutrements of Greek life. Here's a little statue, probably Heracles, the son of Zeus, one of the greatest of the Greek heroes. They found a huge limestone head. It measures something like two and a half feet. This is where you and why I keep going on about dimensions. It's very hard when you see them on the screen. Two and a half feet, that's a big statue it must have come from. It is now in the Kabul Museum. It was found in the gymnasium, and it may well be the person who dedicated the building himself. But more than that, it introduces for us the idea of the transmission of knowledge that came across with the Greeks to sites like Ai Hanum. We find that from this point on, heads and figural sculpture are well represented in the region, not often in stone, more often in painted clay. This one is from a second site quite, quite close by, in, actually in modern day Uzbekistan. It's clay as opposed to the limestone one. And what's more interesting is the suggestion by Richard Barnhart recently, who's a historian of Chinese art at Yale, that this idea that came to Greek sites, Greco-Bactrian sites like Ai Hanum, after Alexander, were the prototypes for the kinds of terracotta warriors that we find in China. These ones, I think some of you know from the tombs in Ling Tong. They were made in molds, as opposed to our limestone, which is carved, or our painted clay. But the same idea of this sculpture seems to have been one that was transmitted through Afghanistan to China in the second century, third century BCE. Ai Hanum then represents the Greco-Bactrian period. It was destroyed about 150 CE. This period when Greek ideas came across, Greek, penetra Greek cultural penetration in the idea of figural sculpture, the Greek language, the Greek alphabet, Greek coinage. Now you're actually looking at a figural head on a coin here, the system of weights. But this was not one-way traffic. Ideas also spread from east to west. This was exactly the time when the classical world learned about Indian astronomy and Indian mathematics. And these ideas, too, would have come from India through Afghanistan across the Silk Road into the Mediterranean basin. And this idea of interchange along the Silk Road is exactly what we see in our second site. And that's the site of Bamiyan in the center of Afghanistan. Bamiyan, which comes from the Sanskrit word Barmayana, which means colored, is a valley. And again, look, different spellings. You have to just use whatever seems right to you. It's a valley west of Kabul, about uh, 8,000 feet. You can see the Himalayas and the Hindu Kush in the background, the snow-capped mountains in the background. This extraordinary fertile valley with rock-cut cut Buddhist monasteries cut into the face of the mountains behind. It was a major site on the Silk Road. And this is a nice map from an exhibition at the British Museum of Silk Road Finds. The Silk Road, which stretched from China to the Mediterranean from sometime from around the time of Christ up until about the 15th century. And here's Bamiyan nicely on it. Bamiyan is on the spur that leads down into India, and it was one of the main sites for the diffusion of Buddhism. Buddhism, you probably all know, the teachings of Buddha, who was born sometime in the 6th century in northeast India. Prince Siddhartha, 
meaning he who has attained his goal. He came from the warrior class, but he renounced his class and he became an ascetic and wandered in search of enlightenment, which he achieved through meditation, and hence he became known as Buddha, the enlightened one. And his ideas, his teachings spread in the opposite direction of this little arrow on the Silk Road from India up across the Silk Road and eventually into China, where it became, where Buddhism became a very popular religion. And we can trace this transmission exactly through Buddhist monasteries, such as the one in Bamiyan, or the one that I'm showing you with the little picture of the ladies all dressed up in silk robes from China, their wonderful pigtails or headdress that looks like pigtails. Uh, so Buddhism comes along this road to become a major world religion with something like 350 million followers today. And it's Afghanistan that connects India, in this case, to China. We know that lots of Chinese also came the other way. So here's a map showing you the 6th, 7th century traveler, Xuan Zhang. He's the one with the solid line here. He travels from China in search of sutras. Those are Buddhist teachings that had been lost in the Chinese canon, but that were still available in India. So he makes this pilgrimage along the Silk Road and then exactly down through Bamiyan. He actually left an account of his travels. He traveled for something like 10,000 miles over 15 years. And he stopped in Bamiyan in 632. So he's the model, you could say, for the modern traveler, Sir Oral Stein, who was looking for many of the same things, antiquities, and whose objects, many of them ended up in the British Museum, which is where they have the wonderful show of the Silk Road and that map. So here's Bamiyan, this enormous valley, this long valley, with two monumental Buddhas, cut into the cliff. There's a seated one as well. Here are the two standing ones. The one to the west is 175 feet high. That's something like a 20-story building. Absolutely enormous. The one to the east, slightly smaller. It's only 120 feet. It's still absolutely enormous. It's about 12 stories. And they represent the first appearance in art anywhere of the colossal image, cult image, really colossal cult images. And for the art historian, they're equally interesting for their method of um, manufacture. I think you can see on the head that's fallen down here that they are actually made out of, they were sculpted out of the rock, but that then they were covered with this mud covered with, mixed with straw and then covered, that's attached with dowels. And I, over here on the right, you may be able to see some of these holes for the dowels. Then they're pegged into the rock, coated with lime plaster. And then we think, originally, the faces were gilded. You can see down here the dowel holes. But you have to imagine what this 20-story building with this huge gilded face would have looked like the pilgrim coming across the valley and all you could see would be like the Empire State with its gilded top. You can get some idea of the scale if you see this little person standing at the bottom. These are absolutely colossal. <coughs> and what they represent is the power of Buddhism and the centrality of Afghanistan in this period from the 5th to about the 9th century. I think we all know what happened to these colossal Buddhas. They were blown up by the Taliban in March of 2001. There's a picture of them being blown up, what it looks like afterwards. Now, the ostensible reason the Taliban claimed that they blew them up because they were afraid that someone might use these images as idols. That is, against Islam, they might worship them instead of worshiping God, the one God, which is the central tenet of Islam. 
That may be true, but they had put up with these statues for a long time, centuries. No one had objected. And there may well have been more subtle political concerns going on. The Bamiyan Valley is home to the Hazaras. These are Persian-speaking Muslims. They belong to the Shia sect, the kind of Muslim that is uh, kind of Islam that's practiced in Iran today. Strict opponents of the Taliban, who are Sunni Muslims, and it may well be that the Taliban blew them up as much to destroy the prosperity of the Bamiyan Valley and they hate their hated rivals, Hazaras, as it was for any religious reasons at all. It led to, this event led to widespread condemnation, but there was one interesting thing that happened afterwards. There were some interesting archaeological results. The blow-up revealed that there were more caves behind the ones that we knew of, 50 additional caves. Twelve of them had untouched wall paintings, and these wall paintings were conserved by the Getty Conservation Institute at the Getty in California and others at the Louvre and so forth. And they uncovered all sorts of interesting information by 2008. They found, for instance, um, that this seated Buddha, the one you see on the right here, was wearing vermilion robes because they were able to analyze the, the paint. Oops, I just lost my screen here. And these are, they reckon, the first oil paintings known, to man, known in the, around the world. They are not, as we saw at frescoes, they are oil paintings. And they predate, therefore, the introduction of oil painting in Europe by centuries. Explorers further discovered in 2008 another cave with a third Buddha. We don't know very much about that. It's about a 300-meter Buddha. But in contrast to the other two who are standing, this one is lying down, representing the Buddha achieving, achieving nirvana. And finally, this archaeological investigation allowed us to redate the sites pretty precisely to the 5th to the 9th century. There had been some speculation about when they dated before. But what this site also does is it introduces us to our third venue in this little lecture and our third religion, and that is the religion of Islam, which today you probably know encompasses about one quarter to one fifth of the world's population. And here we see people praying, men, of course, praying in a mosque in Afghanistan, all facing west toward Mecca, taking their shoes off and wearing the white turbans that are typical of Afghanistan. You also, I often ask my students, how do you know where this is? And they say, I don't know where it is. And I say, yes, you do. Look closely. You can see the architecture is brick. We talk about this in class a lot. This is a region of brick architecture. These textiles also are typical of Afghanistan. The site is Herat on the west in the Hari River. This is a Google map I took off the web. You can see the Hari River here and the, Af the oasis of Herat around it. It too is an old site. It probably goes back as far as um, the time of Ihanum. But it flourished particularly in the 12th century under the patronage of a local dynasty. And that dynasty is called the Gurids because they came from a small city in a mountainous region called Gur, not so far from Herat itself. And Gur was so isolated that up until the 12th century, they were still pagan in this valley. They only converted to Islam in the 12th century and about 1200. They took over the region. You can see spreading on this map all the way from Iran to India to the southwest. And they become one of the first major Afghan dynasties of Islamic times. This area is so remote that the major monument of the Ghurids, this extraordinary minaret, was only discovered, to Westerners anyway, in 1957. So it was built in 1174, and it was basically unknown 
anyone in the West until 1957. This area is still inaccessible. It is a tour de force of both architecture and decoration. It stands an extraordinary 255 feet. That's 25 stories high. And it's remained intact in this earthquake-prone region. Rory Stewart visited it. You have to understand that this must be a more miraculous feat of engineering. The decoration is pretty stunning as well. It's covered. It's completely covered. The entire shaft is covered with verses of the Quran. The patron's name is let up in nice light blue. And it reflects the conversion of the region to the area. Their major capital was the city of Herat, where they redid the main mosque in the city. This is what it looks like today. We have several bits of it which date back to around 1200 when the Gourds took control. They redid the arches. They added a stunning doorway, just like the Minaret of Jam. You can start to see the Gourd style with this blue tile work and the patron's name and date around it. Really stunning decoration, absolutely stunning, and meant to dramatize the role of the new faith in the region. It's hard for us to understand, but Herat is an extremely rich area. It's rich not just for agriculture, it's an oasis on the river, but also for metalwork. It was the center of production for a whole series of candlesticks. Here's one in Cairo, but you can see another one on display right now in the Freer Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. These candlesticks weigh about 10 pounds each. They're about a foot high. And the most extraordinary thing about them is that they are made of a single sheet of brass. A sheet of brass that's hammered from the inside with something called a snarling iron where you bang on one end and the other end jumps up. And it pushes out all the decorations. So all these birds are made of the same piece of metal as the rest of the candlestick. Same, too, with these lions with the wonderful bulging eyes. It's all one sheet of metal. You didn't add anything to it. You just punched it out to make this extraordinary decoration. It's further inlaid with copper and silver. I think you can see the nice decoration around here. Absolutely extraordinary. And what's even more interesting is that it seems these were not necessarily made for rulers, but made for the market. And we know that because the most extraordinary of the vessels that was produced in Herat around 1200, this one actually was a little earlier, dated 1173, is this bucket called the Bobrinsky bucket after Count Bobrinsky, who owned it before it went to the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. It's actually signed and dated, and it says that it was made for a merchant. So it was not made for a king or a prince, but it seems to have been made for a merchant. As far as we can figure out, it was a bath bucket. That is, a bucket you take into a Turkish bath or a hammam and you pour water over yourself with, and decorated with extraordinary scenes. You can see rows of figures, some are hunting, some are feasting. The little detail here in color or at the edge of the black and white shows them playing chess. Can you all, or backgammon actually, can you see the backgammon board? Here's the man seated next to it and the people over here fighting with sticks. There are bands above and below with writing. These are actually what we call animated letters. The letters turn into people. So the letters, this is Arabic writing with good wishes at the top, has faces of people, and some of them end in snake's head, or here's a little fish down here. And the latest research has suggested that this might have been something like a sampler that the metalsmith made to give to the merchant who took it around 
and said, do you want to order one? You can have one with a pattern of people playing games. You can have some inscriptions on it. And it has a whole range of things, like a sampler, or like the kind of box that 17th century journeymen would take around door to door and say, look, I can make things for your house, and I can put this kind of joint or that kind of joint on them. Same thing here. They went door to door, and they would say, you can have this or that kind of decoration. Herat then was destroyed. There's Herat over here. Destroyed by Genghis Khan and the Mongols, just after this period of fluorescence around 1250. And then suddenly, it comes back to life. Or not suddenly, it comes back to life thereafter. And it becomes a major center again under the Timurids in the 14th and 15th centuries, producing yet another cultural fluorescence, this time with illustrated manuscripts. And it's from these illustrated manuscripts that we get a good idea of the life. This is the frontispiece to the manuscript. And it seems to represent the court of the patron. You have to imagine entering through the door here, coming across a courtyard where they are busily decanting wine. Notice this guy has had a little too much of the wine. Other people are bringing in fruits and, and things for the party. And the party is going on to the left. The image moves from right to left, just like Arabic, where the sultan himself is seated on a rug underneath a nice tent with his name on it, in front of his palace pavilion, with musicians playing around him, and someone else who seems to have passed out. Here's a detail showing you the sultan himself, and this kind of incredibly rich interior decoration with these wonderful textiles. The rug just tipped up 90 degrees, and you can see it with this geometric and floral design the wonderful garments, these patterned silks and silk robes, this wonderful turban with the egret feather on the top, little Chinese blue and white and gold vessels below. An extraordinary time that produced probably the most famous Persian painter of all time, Bezad. This is another, manu another painting within that same manuscript, probably his most famous work. It shows the seduction of Yusuf the biblical Joseph, who's fleeing from Potiphar's wife. The story goes that she was in the palace and she tries to seduce him. He flees through seven doors, and there are actually seven doors here. He is about to yield in the last room when suddenly he realizes, no, he can't do it, even though he's alone. God is his witness, and he turns to flee. If you remember the story from the Bible, she goes before her husband, Potiphar, and says, oh, it was Joseph who tried to seduce me. And he said, no, it was me who tried, who, who she who tried to seduce me. And the judge decides by looking at Joseph and saying, Are you, is your garment torn from the front or the back? It's torn from the back. So Joseph was clearly fleeing, and it's clearly the wife who was guilty. This is a biblical story that's been incorporated into the Quran and received extra Quranic uh, embellishment in the Persian literary tradition, and here reaches its extraordinary visual depiction in this absolutely magnificent image. So what can we see from all of these things about the arts of Afghanistan? Here are our three sites, Ay Khanum, Bamiyan, and Herat. Well, first I think you have to call attention to the setting. And really, we don't have a unified Afghanistan. We have individual areas that are set off by mountainous regions. And really, only in modern times can we call this whole area Afghanistan. And it is somewhat of a different, it's somewhat difficult to talk about that in historical perspective. We have to constantly think about setting and the importance of water in this basically dry region. Ay Hanum was located at the confluence of two rivers. Herat is on the major river through Afghanistan, so they're both riverine cities. Bamiyan exemplifies the kind of valley that gets its water from runoff from the mountains. 
So always, whenever you teach or think about a city in this part of the world, you have to ask, what's the source of water? Another point, you have to talk about the religions that were grouped in this part of the world. These three sites exemplify paganism, Buddhism, Islam, but I could have also talked about Manichaeism, Zoroastrianism, Nestorian Christianity, and a host of others. Because this mountainous region became home to many eclectic sects, which went there specifically to escape, but also to spread and proselytize their religion. Third point, I think you have to recognize the prevalence of figural imagery and pictures of people and sculptures of people, even in this region that we think of that now forbids figural imagery. This was always a place where we had many pictures of people. In Islam, you don't use figures of people in the religious aspect of life, but you certainly had them and have them in private life. And this whole idea of avoiding figures or blowing up figures is something that's quite new and quite different to the two millennia of history in this part of the world. And finally, I think you have to think of the natural resources that were traditionally available in this part of the world. It is a center for mining. It still is. I heard on NPR the other night that they're hoping to opened the world's largest coal mine in Afghanistan. It's the center for pigments, for the minerals from which you make these stunning pigments over here. Lapis lazuli, the most expensive uh, pigment after gold, is found only in Afghanistan. And in fact, finding it in Egyptian tombs shows you immediately that you must have had trade with Afghanistan all the way back to something like the third millennium BCE. So to conclude, you can look at Afghanistan as a series of local developments, enclaves that created art in specific areas, enclaves that flourished in spite of political chaos. But you can also see Afghanistan as a connector that spread ideas from Europe to China and through India. And it's that that I think makes it a cultural crossroads. Thank you so Thank much, you. Sheila. So interesting. Um, I'm going to go ahead and change the presenter back to me. So it's our mm -hmm. uh, PowerPoint that's shown here. And I will go ahead and at this point um, invite questions from people. Okay. I know that we had a few questions come in during the webinar, and we'll start with those as people are brainstorming. But I do invite anyone who is interested to go ahead and insert their questions into that question box. Uh, if you have a question that you'd like to ask orally using your phone or your mic, you can raise your hand and we'll unmute you and call on you so that you can ask that question. So I can already see some questions coming in, which is great. I'm going to go ahead and start with one, actually three, that came in during um, the presentation that were all along a similar theme. And um, that theme is thinking about you know, the art of Afghanistan kind of being a hybrid of so many different influences. We have multiple people asking if there's anything about art in Afghanistan that is unique or distinctly Afghan, or because you mentioned that really Afghanistan as a, as a whole hasn't existed and it's been more of a regional thing, is there anything kind of distinctive to particular regions of Afghan art? Well, I think one of the things that makes it distinctive is exactly this melding of cultures. And you have few other places where you have so many things that come together at different times from both East and West. And so you have, on the one hand, Greco-Bactrian art that has um, ideas from the East, but you're also getting in materials like silk that are, uh, sorry, Greco-Bactrian art with figural imagery that comes from the West, but you're getting silk and textiles that come from the East. So what really, I would say, sets it apart is this idea that all these different things come together here. Great. Uh, we have another question here. Um, this one says, it's a privilege to listen to you, a prolific writer on Islamic art. And the question is about the miniature paintings. And um, our participant is wondering, why is it that the human figures have mostly Asian and maybe Chinese features? Oh, rounded the faces person miniature, and, and uh, look very um, 
Right, instead of seeing Afghan or Arab or Persian features until the later period. So his question is, why is that? Well, it's very hard to say what is Afghan. Right. I mean, these were Turco-Mongolians who came in from the steppe. These are the descendants of Timur. This is the grandson of Timur you're looking here. Uh, and again, that uh, you still have in Afghanistan um, blonde-haired people who probably are the descendants of Alexander. Uh, I don't know if any of you saw the film The Man Who Would Be King, uh, which is based on, uh, I'm trying to think who's in it, but it's based on this idea that there were leftover survivors who were Greek, uh, who actually still exist in Afghanistan. Now they've probably intermarried. It was a little bit far-fetched. But the whole idea, again, it's ethnically it's very mixed. And that's one of the things that comes up today politically and one of the reasons that the bombing of Bamiyan might have been a political act, that there are these mixed cultures. There are the Hazaras, who are Persians. Uh, there are the Uzbeks, who are another ethnic group. There are the Pashtuns, who come from the southeast. And so they're all mixed here. We don't know in this miniature whether they're actually depicting um, real life people or whether they are more um, models or stereotypes. Uh, but they certainly seem to reflect the Turco-Mongolian types that were in the area at the time. We do have noticed that, uh, you might not have noticed, some of the figures were black. So we clearly seem to have black, had black people in Afghanistan in the 15th century. And your answer kind of underscores what some of our earlier presenters in this series have said, really um, wanting students and Americans in general to recognize the diversity, the ethnic diversity, the racial diversity that does exist that sometimes we, we over overlook when we're teaching and thinking about Afghanistan. So that's right. a great example. Uh, we have another question from Landon who wants to know, are there images of musical performances or instruments and kind of what was the relationship between art and music in Afghanistan? Okay, good question. And indeed, some of you may have noticed in the frontispiece to that manuscript where I showed you um, Sultan Hossein being entertained under his tent, in front of him were his musicians, one of whom is playing a lute. So the oud was certainly um, a traditional instrument there. Music in Orthodox Islam always skirts the fringes of um, legitimacy. For Strict theologians, it can be seen as blasphemous because it detracts from your, your immediate attention on writing and the thought of God. For mystics, on the other hand, music is a wonderful way of communicating with God. And so you have these two tangents that are pulled in different directions. You do not ever have music, well, traditionally, you do not have music in a mosque. But these paintings show us clearly that you had music in daily life, and you had music in your court settings. But it's the same way with wine. If we are to believe these paintings, Sultan Hussein and his court were soused half the time. And it's clearly wine. There's actually in this painting in the upper right someone making wine in the corner. Uh, wine, as we all know, is prohibited in Islam. It is forbidden in the Quran. But at the same time, some people drank it. So we have these two sides of life. What you do in a religious setting, setting is not necessarily what you do in your own house or your private setting. And that's why art's so wonderful, because it shows us that everything that's written in a religious vein is not necessarily the whole picture. Very true today, as well as when those were created, I'm sure. Uh, we have a question that actually quite a few people have asked before and during um, the question and answer session, and I'll just read Kathleen's for you. She says, due to the ongoing war in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. were there treasures lost and or stolen? Are the museums in Afghanistan well protected? And is there is an issue of uh, museums and repatriation trying to get artifacts and art back to Afghanistan? Well, that's a very good question, and I wish I could answer it with more authority, but I have not been back to Afghanistan since. Uh, the war broke out in 78. Okay. Um, we have heard stories of the Kabul Museum being looted, but it seems like most of the treasures were hidden away and are available, and there's the idea of should they be put on display, they have refurbished the museum. But the question is who's going to go see it and what protections will it have? There's also the problem in this whole area of earthquake and preservation, and just 
leaving the building alone isn't necessarily going to mean that it's going to stand up. Um, so it is an ongoing problem, and there is quite a debate going on in the literature now. Should these objects, some of the treasures of Afghanistan, be brought out and so-called protected in some other place, be it Paris, London, New York, a traveling exhibition, such as the one of the treasures of gold that some of you may have seen that's been going around the United States? Or should they be kept in Afghanistan? And it's a really tricky question to answer because we just don't know how safe or how settled the situation is or will be. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we also have a question from a teacher who has taken some different courses and mm -hmm. has been really interested in how uh, different empires and historic leadership and governments have supported artistic endeavors through patronage and that type of thing. And she's wondering if there's any sort of tradition like that that Afghan leaders have historically played in supporting the development of art or architecture in kind of a systematic way? Well, certainly these manuscripts, particularly the ones we were looking at at the end, were all the products of courts and their rulers. Uh, but at the same time, we don't seem to have a tradition of what we would call public support of the arts. There's nothing like setting up a museum. That's, that's a or giving your money or your collection to a museum to put it on, private, on public display. That's a very Western idea. That doesn't seem to have existed. These people financed art. They paid artists, but it was mostly to keep the works at home. Now, the Buddhist art from, say, Bamyan was, was different. That was made by Buddhists, presumably um, simply in homage uh, for veneration but not necessarily, again, to be put on public display for the idea that people should go and learn from it. It was more um, homage. What is interesting is that a lot of the art from the medieval period, the objects, like the buckets and the candlesticks and so forth, seem to have been um, much more than not necessarily only royal patronage, but um, the middle, what we might call the middle class, meaning, of course, the upper middle class, but rich merchants, um, travelers, and the like. And that, that's interesting, because that's different from, from the kinds of royal patronage we see, say, in the Taj Mahal or something like that. Right. Um, we also have kind of a question about the tradition of art today in Afghanistan. And a few different people ask similar questions, so I'm going to try to kind of summarize them. They're wondering about um, the relationship between modern art in Afghanistan and these kind of traditional art forms that we're used to seeing, and also how the rule of the Taliban and other governments have really affected the lives and experiences of artists in Afghanistan. How have they um, handled this, and how have they right. uh, kind of transformed over that time period and shifting into today? Right. Well, you have to remember, in many cases, art is somewhat of a luxury, and um, the ability to create art depends in part upon the ability, the accessibility of materials. And those are in short supply these days in many places in Afghanistan. There has been a revival, um, particularly under Western um, auspices, to try to recreate some of the traditional crafts, pottery, weaving, and the like. Uh, but in times of war, it's very difficult to keep your craft tradition going. And locally, it has not been encouraged, shall we say. The Taliban's view of art is pretty low. Although Mullah Omar apparently had sculptures in his garden, pretty ghastly sculptures, but we did see that he had sculptures. Um, there was an a article in the New Yorker, some of you may have read, about um, discovering Mullah Omar's garden with these sculptures in it. And then they became the centerpiece of a um, TV show called The Agency, where they decided to, in this fictitious TV show, blow him up. And they used um, the model of a bowl that was actually made in near Afghanistan in the 10th century as a present they were going to give to this terrorist and then blow him up with it. <laughs> it shows you. But art today is not a major feature. And that, and if you, you can't really have any visual expression, um, you can practice calligraphy. But again, um, many of the traditional inks and so forth are not available anymore. So it's, it's a hard road now to practice art in Afghanistan. And as you know, many of the people in our audience are teachers or educators. And uh, we have a question asking, do you have any favorite techniques for using 
art and images from Afghanistan to teach about Afghanistan's history and culture? Are there any kind of favorite go-to techniques or um, resources that you, you like to use for that purpose? Well, you could use um, anything that, that um, what would I use? Because unfortunately, I teach a little older than that. Um, you could use things that come along the Silk Road and try to show how objects migrated along the Silk Road, such as a carpet. So bring in a carpet. You probably all have carpets, maybe, little carpets. I have lots of carpets. So I always bring them into class, and I sort of try to explain how carpets are furniture in a furnitureless world. There's not a lot of wood in this part of the world. So people make textiles into domestic architecture. They use them for tents. They sit on them. They sleep on them. They eat off of them. And it's kind of fun to ask people or ask kids, how many ways can you change this room by changing the textiles in it? How do you make what is the living room into the bedroom where you just sleep on the mat instead of eating on it? Um, what else could you do? You could make patterns, wonderful geometric patterns. And if you take a look at any of these traditional paintings, you'll see all kinds of patterns going on at the same time. And you could ask the kids, well, we have stripes, we have uh, geometric designs, we have lattices, we have flowers. How can you arrange all these patterns? Great. Well, we have uh, about five minutes left, so I have just one more question before we wrap up. Um, Again, many of our audience members are either teachers or people who are very interested in education. So I'm just wondering, is there um, any kind of takeaways, any important things that you think American students or Americans in general should know about um, Afghan art, Afghan architecture? What, what would you want students in the United States to know about this topic? Um, first of all, I would, I would like them to know in America that a lot of it existed before America ever came around, so that it's a very old tradition. Secondly, that what we hear about today, like blowing up images, is not always what happened in the past, that they made a lot of images, they made a lot of beautiful things. And I guess third, that it's this mixture of things and this constant change that makes it very interesting. Great. Well, um, thank you so much. I don't know if you have any final words that you'd like to share before we move on. It's been fantastic hearing you and, and hearing your answers to these questions. Um, just, I think it's really important to have people look, and that's why I'm sorry it was so quick that we didn't get to linger over these images, uh, be they of architecture or painting or sculpture or whatever, but how they were made and the ability to bring the materials to these remote areas and exploit them and find the workers just opens up a whole new world of the transfer of ideas and the transfer of technologies from east to west and west to east and north to south and back and forth. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much again, Sheila. Uh, it's been a real pleasure hearing you and learning a little bit about art and architecture. And I'm going to go ahead and put you on mute, but I hope you'll stay tuned for a bit. OK. All right. So um, thank everyone for joining us for today's webinar. We hope you found it interesting and informative. Uh, I would like to tell you, and this kind of reminds me of what Sheila was just saying, she wishes we'd had more time for you to explore these resources and look a little more closely. And in that vein, I really would encourage everyone to learn more about Afghanistan's history, culture, people, and of course, art and architecture by looking at the Asia Society's Homeland Afghanistan website. And I have that URL up um, on the screen right now, and we'll send that in the follow-up email as well. This is an absolutely fantastic resource online, free that's been developed by the Asia Society. Um, it's great for personal knowledge and also for classroom use. Basically, it's a portal that contains 75 short, beautiful, information-packed documentaries uh, with commentary from leading experts, including Professor Blair, and then also including uh, Thomas Barfeld, who was a presenter on our first webinar in this series. So again, I really encourage you to look at these. It includes the transcripts. It includes resources. You can actually play with those primary sources. It's a fantastic, fantastic website. Um, in particular, in relation to today's topic, there are three videos from the website. There are many more, but I just chose three that uh, I'd like to mention. And hopefully, you'll have time to go check those out. Uh, you can access any of these using the search bar on the Homeland Afghanistan website, or we'll also send you the links in a follow-up email. So the first video I wanted to mention is called Art in Everyday Objects. And um, this one is 
really interesting for seven minutes long. It really packs, packs a lot of information in. It basically explores the difference between Western and Afghan ideas of art. It looks at some of the major art forms in Afghanistan and the role that art plays in everyday life in Afghanistan. Um, the second video that I think really fits with today's topic is called The Golden Age of Central Asia. Uh, this, again, a very short video, uh, provides an overview of the Timurid Empire, which was really Central Asia's most um, accomplished era in the art, literature, and architecture. It highlights some of the key architectural forms of the Golden Age, particularly, obviously, in Afghanistan. And this gets a little bit to the role that Afghan kings played in supporting artistic development in that time. So that gets to the question someone had about patronage and how um, Afghan leadership has supported the development of art over time. And the third video that I thought fit nicely with today's topic, and certainly with the last part of Professor Blair's presentation, uh, focuses on the art of the book. So this is those miniature drawings and the books that um, were so important in Afghan's history as far as art goes. And this video, again, quite short, just a few minutes long, looks at the artistry of the books and really focuses on calligraphy and miniature paintings. This is um, one of Afghanistan and I think the Islamic tradition's really interesting art forms. And this is one that uh, Professor Blair is also a commentator on. So I would definitely say that if you're looking for resources for your schools uh, or for yourself, Homeland Afghanistan is a great place to start. Before we close, just a couple of things uh, that are upcoming at Primary Source. The first is that tomorrow, that's right, tomorrow, we have a global read of Girl in Translation. Uh, it's happening from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This webinar will feature a live chat and a Q&A with Jean Kwok, who is the author of Girl in Translation. If you're not familiar with the book, uh, this tells the story of a young girl named Kim who comes to the United States with her mother in the 1980s. It's loosely based on the author's own life. It's fascinating. It traces Kim, uh, Kim's experiences as an immigrant, as a student who is balancing, really trying to get ahead in school during the day with working at a sweatshop at night. So I would really encourage you, even if you haven't read the book, to register using the links provided. I think Maggie is typing those in right now to the chat box. Uh, I'd encourage you to register and check it out. You can watch it before you read the book if you're interested in reading it as an introduction. Or we'll send the link so that anyone who's registered can watch the video later if you'd like to watch it with your students after you've read the text. So uh, we also have a complimentary toolkit that goes with that that has activities and teaching ideas based on the book. So please do uh, take a look at those if you're interested in bringing in some global reading into your classroom or even just for yourself. A couple of other online offerings that might be of interest to you. Uh, we have the Common Core Getting There Globally. This is a three-part webinar series that will introduce global resources and new ways to support Common Core standards and the mastery of 21st century skills. We'll have three webinars, the first of which is on December 6th, and that will be tailored for elementary school teachers. So that's definitely something to check out, and I think Maggie is putting that information up as well. We also still have time for registration for the spring running of our two online China courses. We run two courses, both this year from January 18th to March 28th. And each of these courses uh, you can take for either 45 PDPs or for two graduate credits. And each of them, if you complete them, qualify you to travel with primary source to China or um, is to China in April or May as part of our study tour, which are fantastic opportunities. So again, if you'd like to learn about either the ancient course, Enduring Legacy of Ancient China, or our modern course, I'd encourage you to check that out at primarysource.org backslash online courses. Um, and Maggie, again, put that in the chat box for you. So before we conclude, just one more huge thank you to Professor Sheila Blair and also to the Asia Society whose support has made these webinars freely available to you and whose creation of the Homeland Afghanistan website is really what spurred us to do this webinar series. On behalf of everyone at Primary Source and also the Asia Society, I really want to thank everyone for spending a part of your Wednesday with us. I know this is a very busy time of year uh, with school and everything else, so we really appreciate you taking time out. We will send an email in the coming week with a link to the recording of this webinar, as well as links to Homeland Afghanistan and some of the other online resources that I mentioned. In the meantime, if you are interested, I think I said this to someone in the chat, but if you are interested in learning about other resources to teach Afghanistan, books, films, et cetera, uh, I'd encourage you to look at Primary Sources Online Resource Guide. I've got the URL up there. It's resources.primarysource.org backslash Afghanistan. And this is a great resource for anyone who's interested in finding out what is out there 
for learning about and teaching about Afghanistan. Uh, please stay on after we conclude to take a brief three-minute survey that will help us better meet your needs in the future. And uh, thank you again for joining us, for your patience with my voice. And we really look forward to seeing you either virtually or face-to-face -face in an upcoming primary source event. So have a great evening, and thank you again.